welcome to a good friday service those who are here and those who are online we love you all and we appreciate you for joining us today i want you to turn to romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 8 and then to first john chapter 4 verse 9 to 11. and today we also have the sunday school joining us so let's give them a warm welcome to the kingdom kids Once or twice in a year, we're able to have them join us and worship together. So just don't mind the little noises that may come from time to time. It just shows that we are in a family of God. Amen. Romans 5 verse 6 to 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps... For a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God, can you say, but God, demonstrates His own love towards us. You can write that down, underline it somewhere. God demonstrates His own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross is a demonstration of the love of God. Now let's read 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. In this, the love of God was manifested. The word manifested means to be revealed, to be shown. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. So this is how we understand love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And the word propitiation refers to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So these two scriptures are the key for us to understand the meaning, the heart behind the sacrifice of Jesus on Good Friday. Now when you think about the word Good Friday, what usually comes to your mind? Usually around the world, Good Friday refers to the passion of Jesus Christ. The word passion refers to suffering, enduring pain. And it refers traditionally in Christian circles to the last week before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The sufferings that he endured. So, when we talk about Good Friday, usually the sermons or the songs would highlight the sufferings of Christ, the physical torture that he went through, the sweating of blood at Gethsemane, the beating and the scourging by the Romans, the betrayal by his friends, and also the false testimonies of the religious leaders. We focus on his physical suffering, the stripes on his back, the blood that flowed. He had to carry the cross all the way up to Calvary, the nails, the crown on his thorns, and the physical suffering of death on the cross. That process, that excruciating pain, that even scientifically we try to highlight the immensity of that through scientific explanations. Now, we understand that more than just the physical pain that he suffered, it was also the spiritual suffering that he carried for us, our sins, our curses. The rejection from the Father. But today I want to highlight something a little different. Now, we know that He suffered and He suffered greatly. But if our emphasis always is on His physical sufferings and we don't understand the larger picture behind it, it may even give us a misdirected focus of what we can understand when we observe Good Friday service. And when we focus only on His physical sufferings, sometimes we end up feeling sorry for Jesus for His sufferings. So we tend to come on a service on Good Friday and enter into that feeling of that, even guilt for ourselves, because it is our sins that put Him on the cross. So we enter into that somber and that 
solemn mood in a heart where we are trying to stir up emotions to feel sorry for his suffering to feel sorry for ourselves also because it is our fault that he was put up on the cross and then what happens is that we don't understand the why behind it all the larger picture so let's go into the scriptures today and I want to present a larger picture of the sufferings of Christ more than only highlighting the physical aspect of his suffering if you can get a glimpse into the heart of God into the motivations of his heart why Jesus was willing to go through all of that then we will see that it was more than just obedience to God it was more than just a duty that he performed it was more than just a judicial act of sacrifice that was necessary but in that act of sacrifice on the cross what we see is the unfailing eternal everlasting unconditional love of God on display because the word passion also means this the willingness to suffer for the one that you love that's what the word passion means let me share with you a story. One day, an 11-year-old girl asked her father, What are you going to give me for my 15th birthday? Her father replied, Please wait. There is a lot of time that is left. When the girl was 14 years old, she fainted and she was rushed to the hospital. The doctor came out and told her father that she had a bad heart and she was probably going to die. When she was lying on the hospital bed, she said softly, Daddy, have they told you that I am going to die? The father replied, No, you are going to live, as he left her room weeping. She asked, How can you be so sure? He turned around from the door and said, Because I know. A short time later, she turned 15, and after she was released from the hospital and she was recovering, she came home to find a letter on her bed which was written by her father and the letter said my dearest daughter if you are reading this letter it means that everything went well just as i told you that it would a little while ago you asked me what i was going to give you for your 15th birthday i didn't know it then but my present to you was my heart you see, her father had donated his heart so that his child could live. So this action of the father, the action actually reveals the intensity of his love for his daughter. So when we study the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and we see every action of God, the motive behind, the picture, the story that it will give to us is of the love of God that is demonstrated from Genesis to Revelations. There is one story that is a common thread from Genesis to Revelations. And that story is actually of the love of God. Not the anger, not the judgment, not the righteousness of God. All of that are included but the main thing that comes forth when we study scripture from the light of Calvary and Good Friday is about the love of God so let's look at some of the scriptures Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 and I'm going to bring forth from the scriptures the times and the pictures that are a demonstration of the love of God because these are types and pictures of the cross. And the Bible is absolutely clear. The cross is a demonstration of the love of God. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Adam and, wife, Adam and his wife Eve, they sinned. When they sinned, according to God's command, they died. They didn't die physically, they died spiritually. They were separated from the love and the life of God. But God still loved them 
and God had a plan to redeem mankind from their sins. So from the beginning we see that God did something that was so significant that when we just read the scriptures, we actually miss the meaning behind this. It's just one verse. And that verse says, Adam and his wife were covered with tunics of skin. God covered them. Which means that God had to take the skin from the animals. Which means that God was the one that performed the first sacrifice in the Garden of Eden. The animal was killed, the blood was shed, and the skin of the animals covered Adam and Eve. That is a symbol, a picture, a type of what would happen on the cross when the sacrifice of Jesus and His blood shed would cover us from all our condemnation, our guilt, and our sins and make us acceptable before the Father. Can you say Amen? So this is the first picture of the cross that we see even in the book of Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22, verses 8 and then from 12 to 13. The Bible says here that Abraham lifted his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now we know this story. God comes to Abraham and God asks Abraham to take his son, his only son, the son whom he loves. And mind you, in Genesis 22 is the first time in scripture that the word love appears. And the word love appears in the context of a father who is willing to sacrifice his son in obedience to God. So Abraham takes Isaac, they go up Mount Moriah. While they are going up Mount Moriah, Isaac asks the father, what are we going to sacrifice? And in verse 8, Abraham said, God is going to provide for himself a lamb for an offering. Now we know that Abraham took Isaac, placed him on the altar, and he was about to strike him. When the voice of the angel of the Lord came and said, do not sacrifice your son. For now I know that you obey and you have faith in God. And so God provided a ram that was hidden in the bushes so that Abraham could take that ram and sacrifice that ram in the place of his son. And as Abraham is walking down the hill, his heart is filled with the gratitude towards God that God provided a substitute for his son. That ram was a demonstration of God's love for Abraham. But in this story, there is also a demonstration of God's love for mankind. Because many centuries later, on this same mountain range, outside Jerusalem, another father, our heavenly father, sacrificed his son, his only son, the son whom he loves, for all of mankind, God provided. God provided a lamb for a sin offering. And so this picture that is there embedded in the Old Testament is another picture of the cross, a type, which is a demonstration of God's love for mankind. Let's look at another portion of scripture. Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. And in the future, if you come to church, I recommend highly that you bring a Bible. Amen? And if you don't have a Bible, I recommend highly that you sell your phone and get a Bible. Yes. Investing in a Bible is one of the greatest investments that you can make. A good Bible. Now, if you have one of the small New Testament Bibles, you may not get much benefit out of it. When I got saved, a friend of mine invited me and he told me, come, I'll take you to a bookstore and we can get a good Bible for you. 
I thought he was going to buy me that Bible and I was very excited. So I went to that bookstore in Singapore and he showed me all the good Bibles and he showed me a study Bible. It was very expensive. And he said, you buy this. And he walked out of the room. So I was like in a fix. Do I buy this? It's so expensive. But of course, I was a little embarrassed. I could not just walk away empty handed. So I bought that Bible. The most expensive Bible I've ever bought. But I'm so glad that I did that because that Bible brought me such immense blessing for eternity that as I read the study Bible, I began to understand the scriptures. A lot of the questions that I always had were answered in that study Bible. So I encourage you to invest in a good study Bible. Even if it is four, five, six thousand rupees, take your scholarship money and invest in a study Bible instead of going out on a date. The value of that date will not last for more than two days. The value of that Bible will be for eternity. Can you say Amen? Amen. Exodus chapter 12 verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now we know that this was the final judgment that came on Egypt. The death of every firstborn. Pharaoh had resisted the commandment of God through Moses up till this time. So God instructed Moses to tell all the children of Israel that every household must keep a lamb with them for 14 days. And on the 14th day at twilight, sacrifice that lamb. Take the blood of the lamb and apply it on the doorpost of your house, on the lintel. And then you eat the meat of the lamb roasted on fire. This is the Passover lamb. Now as they obeyed, and as they applied the blood of the lamb on every household in Goshen, that night when the angel of death passed over Egypt, every household was visited with death. Not only of mankind, but also of animals. Death. Every household of the Egyptians. There was tremendous sorrow, tremendous lamenting. But in the household of the Israelites, there was protection. There was a covering. It was because of the blood of the Passover lamb. Now we know that this story is not referring only to an event in history, but it's a type, an example, a hidden meaning. There's a mystery behind this, that this is referring to Christ who is our Passover lamb. And the sacrifice of Christ, when we believe in it, when we accept it, and we apply the blood to our lives, it covers us, it protects us from the plague of eternal death. Eternal judgment from the presence of God. Even this, which is a type of the cross, is a demonstration of the love of God. Many times we see in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, the judgments of God, the judgments of God, the judgments of God, that when we don't understand the heart of God and we read the Scriptures, we can actually develop fear in the heart, a wrong fear, a wrong slavish fear towards God, and think that God is all about judgment and anger. And immediately punishing us for our sins. Instead of understanding the hidden tone, the mystery behind all of scriptures, that it is really a communication of His love for us. Exodus chapter 21 verse 8. Exodus chapter 21 verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent or a bronze serpent, and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Let me give you the background. Israel was in the wilderness. Every day they were eating manna. They were eating meat, quail in the evening. So they got a little tired of that. And they began to complain. Complain to Moses and Aaron. Complain before God. And because of the complaining, 
the grace of God upon them was lifted and fiery serpents came into the camp of the Israelites and began to bite the Israelites and many of them began to die and there was panic that set into the camp of the Israelites can you imagine hundreds and thousands of people living in camps close quarters and then there are snakes that came in thousands of snakes that came in and people are being bitten can you imagine the confusion the dust the wailing the shouting the running around so in the midst of all that Moses cries to the Lord and God says make a bronze serpent put it on a pole stick it in the middle of the camp and tell them everyone who looks at this fiery serpent everyone who looks at this bronze serpent and the word look there means gaze it doesn't mean look and look away it means look and keep on looking and keep on looking gazing so everyone that gazes at this bronze serpent shall not die but live so hundreds of Israelites were dying but in the midst of all that confusion, in the midst of all that noise, in the midst of even the pain in the legs or hands, wherever they were bitten, they are supposed to look away from the confusion, look away from their herd and look to the cross. Because this bronze serpent is a type of Jesus. Jesus says much later on in the Gospels, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up. This is a type of Jesus. Jesus who was cursed on the cross for you and me. Brass, bronze, fire. Because brass is made in the fire. In the scriptures, whenever you see brass or bronze mentioned, it refers to the judgment of God. Everyone said judgment. So on the cross when Jesus was dying and he said, I thirst. On the cross while he was there and our sins came upon him he took our sins on him at that very moment the fire of God's judgment the fire of God's anger also came upon him so Jesus was cursed on our behalf every curse that should have come upon you your family or upon the Nagas for headhunting and whatever every curse that should have come upon us on a family line Jesus took that on himself and that's why Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14 says we are redeemed from every curse of the law there's someone here you need to know you have been redeemed from generational curses you've been disturbed by certain people who told you that your father's sins and your grandfather's sins have not yet been forgiven and you need to do something sacrificial you need to pay the price so that their sins can be forgiven I want you to know that when Jesus died on the cross Jesus paid for the sins of all humanity that means the people that were there during his time in Jerusalem the people that will come in the future which is us and the people in the past Moses and Abraham all the way to Adam Jesus paid for the sins of all humanity do you know that Abraham is saved because of Jesus' blood? Moses is saved because of Jesus' blood. Adam is accepted by the Father in heaven because of the blood of Jesus. We are redeemed from every curse of the law. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are redeemed from every curse of the law. Amen. So, if you think you cannot be healed of any sickness, I want you to look at the cross like the Israelites did. If you think that you cannot be delivered from any addiction, that you cannot be set free from any bondage, any fear, any darkness in your life, think again. That just as the Israelites in the midst of their death, they were dying. Maybe the venom of that serpent was going through all their body. Maybe they were shaking in the sickness, in that pain. But as long as they looked to the cross, as long as they gazed on that bronze serpent, they lived. Can you say hallelujah? There is power 
in the cross, which means there is power in the love of God. There is power to set you free from any sin, any bondage, any addiction. You just have not looked at the cross again with a new perspective and a new faith. Can you say amen? Next, if you look at the book of Leviticus and we consider every sacrifice that God told Moses that the Israelites have to follow, every sacrifice, every sacrifice, the guilt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Five offerings in detail that the Israelites have to offer continually to the Lord. All these five offerings describe for us to understand the efficacy, the power, the effectiveness of the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That one sacrifice of Jesus is for our sins, our guilt, is for our consecration, our complete walk with God, our peace before God. Every day you can have peace with God. That's what the peace offering means. Every day you can walk in peace before God based on what? The sacrifice of Jesus. Not based on your goodness. Not based on your good works. Even our daily peace with God is based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And there are five sacrifices that are described in detail. The number five is a picture of God's grace. So God's grace is seen in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The grace of God is a demonstration of the love of God. Because God said, for God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross. So the cross is grace given, but it has been sent from a heart of love. So understand love and grace. It is love that sends grace to us that when we accept the grace of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ on the cross, we are actually receiving the love of God. Can you say hallelujah? Amen. So every sacrifice of animals in the tabernacle of Moses, the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, the thousands of sacrifices, even the millions of sacrifices in the wilderness and even in the temple of Solomon, all of them were actually pointing to Christ. Now the Israelites, if they did not understand that, they would be thinking, is God such a demanding God? Is God such an angry God that for every sin we have to sacrifice the blood of animals? And instead of seeing the love of God, they could develop a wrong perspective of God that is an angry, judgmental, vengeful God. Not understanding that if the veil was taken from their eyes, they would have seen that every sacrifice was actually pointing to Christ. And it was because of those sacrifices that God's grace and God's blessing could come upon them, which was a type, a picture, a story for the whole world to understand when we look to the past, when we look to the Old Testament, how the blood of animals provided for Israel a covering for their sins, which is the love of God, so that today the blood of Christ provides atonement for our sins. Hallelujah. Look at John chapter 1 verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the connection. All the animal sacrifices in the old is all summed up in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Which is a demonstration of God's love for us. Next, let's look at the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle. 
with all its artifacts, with all its utensils, and with the system of priesthood which governed the worship of the nation of Israel, the tabernacle out there in the wilderness, the covering made of badger skin, dark, which means when the Israelite looked at the tabernacle, the Israelite could not see the beauty inside, the gold and the priesthood and the incense and the glory of God. The Israelite never saw it because from the outside, all they could see was the covering of the tent, the animal skins, which is a type of Jesus Christ. That when you see Jesus in the flesh, when the Jews saw Jesus walking on the streets of Jerusalem, walking on the streets of Galilee, when he was preaching on the mount, when he was performing those miracles, they saw a human being, they saw an ordinary man, they saw a carpenter, and they could not see beyond the man to understand the beauty of salvation that he was bringing, the glory of God that was there. The tabernacle is Jesus. There's only one entrance into the tabernacle. There's only one entrance to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, we don't have time to study the intricacies because even every little detail, the colors, how it was made, all of that speak about Jesus. But we must understand that every utensil, for example, the altar of sacrifice, where the animals will be burnt every day. That is referring to the cross. The bronze lava, where the priest would come and wash the hands. That is referring to the Word of God. Jesus washes us with His Word. The table of showbread, Jesus is the bread of life. The menorah, the candle stand, Jesus is the light of the world. The altar of incense before the Holy of Holies. That altar of incense is again about Jesus. He is a high priest. He is an intercessor. And then when we enter into the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant is a type of Jesus. The mercy seat upon which the blood was sprinkled seven times, referring to perfect atonement. That mercy seat, the Bible says, is Jesus Christ. Jesus is our mercy seat. So everything in the tabernacle points to Christ. What does Christ point to? for you and me to understand the love of God. So everything in the tabernacle again, once we see that and understand is referring to Jesus Christ. The connection is this, John chapter 1 verse 14 in the Living Bible, John chapter 1 verse 14 is this, the Word became flesh, Jesus became flesh and tabernacled among us. And the word tabernacle is referring to the tabernacle of Moses. Because of the tabernacle of Moses that he built on the earth. When he went on Mount Sinai, Moses was given a pattern. Moses was given a diagram. Moses was given a blueprint. I want you to go down and build everything on the earth just like I showed you in heaven. So Moses comes, explains it to the artisans, and they build a tabernacle. On the final day when it's built, they dedicated with the blood of animals and at that very moment fire comes from heaven and the fire of God enters the tabernacle of Moses and remains there. What does that mean? It means that God wants to live among his people. The presence of God was in the midst of Israel. That is again a picture that God will send his son and he will come and live among us tabernacle with us, dwell with us. That means when we are born again, God comes and He dwells in the heart. Which is again a demonstration of His love. Now let's look at the biblical feasts of Israel. There were seven feasts that they were commanded to observe. Seven feasts, okay? The feast of Passover, which is similar to our times, Good Friday time, unleavened bread, the first fruits, which is on good, I mean Easter, that's the day of first fruits. Then the feast of Pentecost, which is the day then the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. Feast of trumpets, the day of atonement, feast of tabernacles, which also includes the Sabbath, which is not here, 
but the days that they are supposed to observe. I want to present to you that all of these festivals and days that they were supposed to observe is actually pointing to Christ. It's all about Jesus. The hidden mystery of the feasts is about Jesus again. Jesus is a Passover. Jesus was the first fruit from the dead. Amen. Passover, which means, you know, observing that lamb that was sacrificed. First fruit, when Jesus rose from the dead. Pentecost is a time of celebration. Pentecost refers to harvest, which means after the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, the church is now in a season of harvest, harvesting souls for Jesus Christ. So the first four feasts have already been accomplished, even in the history of the church. And we're waiting for the other three when Jesus would return. So all of these are pointing to Jesus and His work. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul says, These are a shadow of what was to come. Referring to days. Days. Observing of days. Observing of festivities. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. So they were a shadow. A shadow of the substance. That means the shadow comes because of the substance. There's a shadow on the stage here because I'm here. The shadow points to the substance. The substance doesn't point to the shadow. The substance is greater than the shadow. That means when the substance has come, that means we must live in the truth and the understanding of the substance, not the shadow. Can you see Amen? Which means for Christians, every day is a holy day. H-O-L-Y. Not H-O-L-I. Every day is a holy day. No day is above the other. Because Christ lives in us. So one day is not more holy than the other. Why we need to say this? Because in a very religious environment like Nagaland, we think. Because Sunday is a holy day. If I go to church on Sunday, I become holy. Or Jubilee time is a very holy time. If I do Jubilee, participate, there is holiness that is attached to me. So we think we become holy by observing days. No, you will not. You will not. You become holy by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And He lives in you, which means you have become a holy person. Your external behavior may not be holy, but on the inside, you are holy. You're already sanctified. Can you say amen? And now as we walk in faith and obedience to Christ, living with Him from the intimacy of our heart, He will teach us to walk in holiness. And we will begin to Esteem every day as holy because every day we live unto Him. Not only on Sundays. Can you say Amen? Hallelujah. So, all the biblical feasts also point to Jesus. Which means they point to the love of God. So the main theme of scriptures is this. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 24, verse 44 to 45 the main theme of the bible jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection when he was teaching his disciples he said to them these are the words which i spoke to you while i was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of moses and the prophets and the psalms concerning me the law of moses is the first five books of the bible from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then the Psalms is referring to Proverbs, the book of Psalms, the Song of Solomon, and so on. The hymns, the songs, the poetry. And then the prophets. The prophets. What Isaiah wrote, what Ezekiel wrote, what Jeremiah wrote, all of that which the Jews considered holy, which is practically the entire Old Testament. Jesus said, all of them are concerning me. They're not just isolated books that were compiled. 
They're not just isolated stories. That when we just read them by itself, it seems that God is angry against sin. That God is judging the Israelites because of their disobedience. But when we put it all together and try to understand from a greater perspective, from the perspective of heaven, then we see that entire scripture is really a revelation of Christ. All of them, Jesus says, are about me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Which means you can know Bible verses and yet not understand the Bible. These disciples, we were with Jesus for three years. Jesus taught them every day. And yet, their eyes were not open yet. Their understanding was not open yet. That's something only God can give to you. May your eyes open today to see that from Genesis to Revelation, there is one theme, there is one story. It's about the love of God demonstrated for mankind. The love of God. Hallelujah. The love of God. That on this day, when we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, and we take time to meditate on the cross, we must make sure that this love, we understand, we allow it to change our perspective, our attitude, and also the way we live life towards our fellow brothers and sisters. This verse came to my heart as we were starting the service. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Luke 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The love of God that was in the heart of Jesus, which He was demonstrating on the cross, was specifically directed even at that very moment to the very people who were crucifying Him, insulting Him. Shaming him, bringing pain upon him. Now, for you to be hurt, let's say last year, for people to have gossiped about you, people to have slandered you, for you have gone some abuse in your life, maybe even as a little child, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, whatever. And then after many years, coming to understand and grow in the knowledge of God and forgive them, that's powerful, that's wonderful. Amen. That's amazing. And all of us should have done that. If you have not done that, well, today is your day. But at that very moment, when someone is just beating you, let's say, right now, someone comes and slanders you, right now if you are going through injustice at this very moment when someone is afflicting you with unspeakable torture at that very moment to respond not with anger disappointment hatred vengeance vengefulness but to respond with love that when jesus on the very cross says father forgive them they do not know what they are doing I believe that is what we call love that is perfected. Love that is complete. Love that is fully matured even in the heart of Jesus Christ. Now it is this love that is demonstrated for you and me. Perfect love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, let's go there. I'm digressing from my points, but let me just flow. First John chapter 4, verse 18. 
There is no fear in love. Let's read from verse 17. I want to bring forth a particular point here. Love has been perfected among us in this. Love has been completed among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Not only boldness in our walk with God today. Boldness in the day of judgment. That means, let's say after you die and you are before the judgment seat of God. Let's say in eternity, all of us are before the judgment throne of God. God wants you to have boldness even there. Boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. As Christ is in heaven right now, so are we in this world. Meaning, we are righteous, we are sanctified, we are children of God. Can you say Amen? Verse 18, there is no fear in love. In this love that God demonstrates for us, in this perfect love, the love that is willing to forgive even in the very act of offense. If you understand this love, there is no fear in love, but perfect love. When we understand this love of our Father casts out fear. The fear of what? Look at the first before that, verse 17, in context. The fear of judgment. The fear of judgment from God. The fear of curses to come from God. The fear of God. Now, I'm not saying there is no discipline. I'm not saying there is no consequence for our sins. In fact, even in fact, if you're going through a period of discipline, it is out of love. There's no fear. Even if you're going through some consequence because of your past actions and your mistakes. Don't go through consequences in fear. Can you understand what I'm saying? Because when you believe that even though you're going through some consequences out of your own mistakes, when you believe that God still loves me, He will bring me out of this. You will have the faith to go through that. You will have the peace to go through that without having this fear that you're condemned and there is no hope because of your past, because of your sins. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. That tormenting fear. That when you have done something wrong, or when your parents have done something wrong, or when you have received a prophecy that because of your parents' sins, and because of your grandfather's sins, this curse, this, this, uh, this accident, this sickness comes. When you start thinking of those things, it's tormenting. Has anyone gone through any of that? It's tormenting. That thought, that false prophecy, it's tormenting. It's like a thorn in your head. Doesn't allow you to sleep. It's like a thorn in your heart. Doesn't give you the freedom to exercise your faith because it's tormenting you. Fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. That means when your heart has grown and matured in the knowledge of God, one of the first signs will be this. There'll be less and fear, less fear, less fear, less fear. You grow in peace. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. The demonstration of God's love. When it fills your heart today, let it drive out every remains torment effects of fear from your heart if the main theme of the bible is jesus christ as jesus said himself then the cross is the most important event in the history of mankind do you agree it's a pivotal moment in history that moment that divides calendars times history of mankind that has changed the destiny of billions of people, those who have believed in Jesus. So if the cross is the most important event in human history, then let me present to you this. The love of God that is revealed from eternity, 
that is seen in all the types of the sacrifice of Jesus in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the feast of Israel, even in the prophets, in the Psalms, and which was finally demonstrated for you and me on the cross. That God demonstrates His love for us in the sacrifice of Jesus. The love of God is the greatest knowledge. The greatest knowledge that mankind can have. It's the greatest knowledge that you can have. But let me also tell you this. If you don't receive this love personally, if you don't seize this love for yourself, and you don't experience it by receiving Jesus into your life, it has no benefit for you. Water is composed of H2O, right? Oxygen and? Come on, science people. Hydrogen, is it? Right, Rodri? Yeah, so H2O. Right? So you know, theoretically, water is H2O. Maybe you are stuck in the desert. There is no water and you're about to die. So when you're about to die, you're thirsting for water. When you're thirsting for water, what you studied in your science class comes to your mind. H2O is the composition of water. So let's say in the desert, you are able to write down the composition of water. You're able to describe perfectly what water is. Right? And yet you have no water. You know what's going to happen? You will die. Knowing the composition of water is of no help to you unless you have physical, actual water and you drink it. Knowing that water is H2O will never quench your thirst. <laughs> Even though you know nothing about water, you just drink it, it quenches your thirst. There are many people out there who don't know what agape is. But they actually spend so much time before God every day. Their heart is always quenched with the love of God. And then there are many theologians like us who know agape. We can write it in the Greek also. And yet our hearts are empty. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? The love of God. It's not just an idea, a concept, a teaching. It must be believed. It must be received. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I believe that you have been blessed by the Word of God. If you have any testimonies or prayer requests any time of the day, you can contact or email us at the information given down below. And if this message has blessed you, we encourage you to please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you and God bless you.